Hello everyone. Amidst the coronavirus pandemic, we are now facing a new challenge, a syndrome called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children related to COVID-19 has been described. And in the next 10 minutes, I would deal with syndrome and how can we all diagnose these children and treat them. So we all know that COVID-19 has been a pandemic that has been spread across the globe caused by SARS-CoV-2. Majority of these patients who have been infected have been asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. However, a proportion of them, especially adults who develop severe illness due to ARDS, the acute respiratory distress syndrome, have, have had a lot of morbidity and mortality. To a larger extent, however, right from the beginning of the pandemic, children have been asymptomatic. But somewhere in April, especially end April 2020, a new entity called the Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome was described in children. These cases first were described in UK, subsequently in US, and now in India, we are seeing similar cases. Now, it was in Mumbai that the last month, of, that is the month of June, uh, the Mumbai hospital started reporting this Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome, reporting it as Kawasaki-like illness. And then you can see of the last week, even many Delhi hospitals have reported Kawasaki-like symptoms in COVID-19 positive kids. Now, what is important? Cases in both these cities emerged in children one month after they saw a lot of cases in adults. That means the surge typically occurs one month after you see a large number of children and adults. And why I'm concerned? Because I practice in Bangalore and in the last three weeks, we have seen a sudden surge of adult COVID cases. So maybe in the month of August, we must be looking out for Kawasaki-like illness in children at our city. Now this childhood multisystem inflammatory syndrome has been rightfully described as a new challenge in this pandemic in this editorial. Now, if you look through this editorial, you realize that these children are not uniform, not all of them present in the same way. Some of them present with Kawasaki disease-like illness. Some of them present in shock, what looks like toxic shock syndrome, and the others can come to you with acute abdomen and often diagnosed to have acute appendicitis or some surgical abdomen, and then they develop multisystem inflammatory syndrome. And a proportion of them can just have fever and raised inflammatory parameters. So you can see this syndrome can present with myriad of manifestations. Now, Important thing is this multisystem inflammatory syndrome typically occurs two to four weeks after infection with SARS-CoV-2 and is an uncommon disease. If you look at this paper published from the New York State, you will realize that COVID-19 infections, though occurred in 322 individuals out of 1 lakh people below the age of 21, this multisystem inflammatory syndrome occurred only in two. Meaning to say, although the background infection rate was high, the actual number of people who actually developed this syndrome is a smaller number. And what is very important to remember, antibody test is positive in majority, while only a few have PCR positive. Again, telling us that this illness occurs late after the antibodies have formed. Now, what's the clinical presentation? Some of these children typically say between the age of 7 to 15 can come to you with fever, rashes over the body and conjunctival injection. And when you look at this child, you would feel this is a child with Kawasaki disease, but not having all the manifestations and would have high CRP, a rising ferritin, what we call the incomplete Kawasaki disease. The others can present again with fever, rash, conjunctival injection, very high inflammatory parameters, but when they present to you, they may be in hypotensive shock. And this is what we label the Kawasaki shock syndrome or the toxic shock syndrome. And here it is important to remember, these children have severe myocarditis causing the shock. And another subset can present to you with acute abdomen. And again, they have very high inflammatory parameters, but then they quickly land up in the hepatic failure, renal failure, the multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. And many of them have cytopenias and features to suggest HLH or the macrophage activation syndrome. So what is very important is that severe cases invariably have myocarditis and they land up in shock. Now, what are the lab features? Marked elevation of CRP as high as 300 milligram per liter has been described and lymphopenia has been a significant feature. So if you see a child coming with high fever, rashes, a very high CRP, neutrophilia and lymphopenia, you must be looking out for this syndrome. These children can have elevated ferritin somewhere between 1000 to 2000. Some of them have cytopenias, hypertriglyceridemia, high D-dimer, high ferritin, all to suggest macrophage activation syndrome. When you get an echocardiography, especially in severe cases, you could see myocarditis with myocardial dysfunction. 
and 10 to 20 percent of them have been described to have coronary changes in the form of dilatation or aneurysms something that you see typically in Kawasaki disease what is very important to make a diagnosis you must have a SARS-CoV-2 PCR positive or an antibody positive or at least a contact with a positive case COVID positive case in the last four weeks to give a diagnosis of multi-system inflammatory syndrome now the next question why after four weeks of SARS-CoV-2 what's the pathophysiology now since this illness appears almost once the children have started developing antibodies it is likely an immune mediated injury and to understand this phenomenon further let us understand immune response of our body normally when you are faced with a virus you expect the body to produce neutralizing antibodies which clear the virus now what happens when the virus enters the body this is a cell the cell gets infected because the virus undergo and uh, enters the cell what we call endocytosis and once it enters the cell there is an uncoating and the viral nucleic acid material is released and the virus multiplies now what happens if you have neutralizing antibodies they would block the entry of the virus into the cell they would also block the uncoating and that is why the virus stops multiplying However, in some of these patients, what you get is an abnormal or I would say aberrant immune response and they develop non-neutralizing antibodies. What do these antibodies do? They cause antibody-dependent enhancement of tissue injury. These antibodies do bind to the virus, but instead of blocking their entry, this entire complex is taken up inside the cell. So there is increased entry of virus into the cell and the cell gets infected. And if these are macrophages, now these macrophages are activated causing a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokine production resulting in a cytokine storm, typically interleukin-6, interleukin-1, and which drive the cytokine storm. And apart from that, since the virus has got maximum entry into the cell, it starts multiplying, causing an increased viral load. Now, this phenomenon of antibody-dependent enhancement has been very well described in dengue virus. We all know that a second episode of dengue can be quite severe, and this is because of this phenomenon of antibody and dependent enhancement caused by the non-neutralizing antibodies. So now scientists are proposing that the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children that we are seeing due to this COVID infection and because of, uh, because of the antibodies is likely caused by this mechanism of antibody dependent enhancement. Now this is also important to understand because when people design vaccines for this COVID-19, this phenomenon would have to be taken into consideration. Now it's also, Important to see that a lot of these children mimic Kawasaki disease. So how do you differentiate? A classical KD presents with uh, typically at a very younger age, less than five years, though it can present late. And most often, uh, the shock is an uncommon phenomenon in classical KD. Less than 5% of patients develop a shock syndrome. However, in the hyperinflammatory syndrome, these children have been a little older, most often between 7 to 15 years of age. And interestingly, more than 50% of them have presented in shock. And this is because of significant myocarditis that has been reported in these patients, whereas in classical KD, myocarditis has been most often subclinical. The trigger has been not known for Kawasaki disease, whereas in the hyperinflammatory syndrome, we know the trigger is COVID-19. So possibly the understanding of this hyperinflammatory syndrome will help us understand Kawasaki disease better. But what is good? The good thing is both these syndromes have been responsive to steroids and intravenous immunoglobulin, and that's the good news. Now, how do you treat these patients? If you see a child coming to you with fever, rash, and high inflammatory parameters, and you have made a diagnosis of incomplete Kawasaki disease, please go ahead and give intravenous immunoglobulin 2 gram per kg. If these patients are refractory to IVIG, the next line would be IV methylprednisolone, 10 mg per kg per day for three days, followed by oral steroids, which you gradually taper. And you would add aspirin in the recommended doses. Now, if a child presents to you with KD shock syndrome or a toxic shock syndrome and you have documented myocarditis, maybe this is one patient where you will not only give IVIG but upfront give IV steroids. And then if they are refractory, consider injection tocilizumab or injection infliximab. Those are the biologicals. Now, if a patient presents to you with MODS and has features suggestive of macrophage activation syndrome, again, clearly there would be a role of IVIG and steroids, but if these patients are refractory, consider cyclosporin, and if they are refractory further on, there would be a role of a biologic like injection tocilizumab. Now, what is very important to understand that these patients, the crux of management would be a good supportive care, and most often when these patients present to us, they would be on a broad spectrum antibiotic cover. 
Now, for you to remember injection tocilizumab, the dosage is 12 mg per kg below the age of 30 kg, and it's 8 mg per kg if a child is above 30 kg. And we all know tocilizumab is an interleukin-6 receptor blocker, and because interleukin-6 is considered to be the key cytokine driving inflammation, there is a lot of discussion about tocilizumab in this syndrome. Injection infliximab is a TNF-alpha blocker, and the standard dose is 5 mg per kg. Now, one of the authors who has written a nice paper on this syndrome clearly states, there is a concern that children meeting the current diagnostic criteria for the multisystem inflammatory syndrome may be just the tip of the iceberg and a bigger problem may be lurking below the waterline. So friends, we are learning new things through this pandemic and I'm sure we'll keep learning. And as we learn and understand things better, hopefully we shall treat our children in a much better way and we shall be able to um, cure most of them. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe.